I now look to Kitcher Edgerton Regions College and the sixth elected member of the Oxford Union Standing Committee to continue the case for the opposition. Good evening. I'd actually like to begin by thanking Spencer, but I'm um, politely declining his offer, which he made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also say I appreciate his enthusiasm for telling everyone how porn is much, much better than a cucumber is perhaps a bit oversharing. <laughs> In my speech, I will be building on some of the excellent points made by the first speaker of the opposition, and will also delve into some other issues surrounding this contentious debate. My argument shall centre on the concern that porn in its current form has become increasingly unrealistic, and when showing extremely graphic porn, does not show that those who enjoy these acts in real life only participate after building a relationship of trust. This misrepresentation can lead people to misconstruing the importance of sex and demeaning the other people that they perform this act with. This debate offers an opportunity to call for an improvement in both in sex education and porn's regulation in this country. It is sex education's responsibility to change its approach to properly educate young people about sex as it, as it is currently failing to do so, and to look further than, than the biological nature of sex so that porn is the main medium th through which sex is learnt about. However, I do hope in the future that, um, the it will be highlighted the unrealistic nature of its content, but this is not yet the case. I should begin by clarifying that when I refer to se sex education, I am talking about how I believe sex education should be, as of course any sexual content could be defined as educational. However, since porn is unrealistic, it is not necessarily educational in the correct manner, a point that the first speaker of the opposition made clear with a driving comparison. Sex education should be, as Planned Parenthood defines it, the means by which people gain information, skills, motivation to make healthy decisions about sex and sexuality, the stress being healthy decisions. I also want to make clear that I'm not arguing against porn, as it is a form of entertainment that many people do enjoy watching. However, I aim to convince you all that this is not sufficient for justifying porn as being a necessary part of sex education. This is not because exploring your sexuality is unimportant to an individual's sexual development. It is that sex education should precede this. Porn should not be how we are first introduced to sex, and the fact it often is shows a failure to properly regulate accessibility to porn and also a failure of the country's current sex education policy, which is still further ahead than other countries. Imagine living in an extremely conservative area, like certain state, US states. It might seem, as Spencer said, that porn actually then has a place in sexual education as it's an alternative way of learning, a way of exploring. The issue with this is that it wouldn't be including sex porn in sex education, but be making porn sex education. That would be ludicrous, still misleading, and also it just isn't the job of porn. As, as I've said, it's a form of entertainment. This leads me to my first point, that porn is presented in a glam presents a glamorized view of sex a clear fantasy, and as such, has no place in correct sex education. As I've said, porn is a form of entertainment, and something that entertains should not be mistaken as synonymous with something that is meant to be beneficially, ed beneficially educate. Like any product, it tries to produce content that entices people in, and it does this with presenting an unrealistic, glamorous portrayal of sex in order to encourage consumption. Moreover, like any successful form of media, it has been marketed well. It targets its main consumers, which in this case are men. Um, the Institute for Family Studies conducted a survey in 2016 to show the aforementioned porn gap between men and women's consumption of porn. The initial finding is that on average, men watch more porn than women. No surprises there. With 33% of casually dating women saying that they watch porn versus 75% of casually dating men. The gap deepens when you're looking at the frequency at, at which porn is consumed where casually dating men are reportedly 42 times more likely to view porn, at least weekly or more, compared to women in the same situation. This gives a clear motive of, for porn to be primarily orientated towards male consumption. Building on the argument of the first speaker, the key point here, here is that such an androcentric media causes damage, not just by encouraging high consumption of porn in men, but also in how it shapes their attitudes towards sex with their partners. I will not delve too, into this too much, as the first speaker of the opposition has covered this, but what I will add is that the potential negative impact of women is not only restricted to the bedroom, but also wider perceptions of women in society. This is evident in day-to-day -day life, where the derogatory language of porn is used to describe people's own sex life. You log into whatever site, and the first titles you see will all be using highly sexualized and aggressive language, such as fucking, pounding, whatever. People can think that this is how sex should be viewed, how it should be talked about, and it seeps into our everyday lives. 
leading to a dehumanizing message of entitlement. By viewing porn and absorbing its language into their vocabulary, people become more used to increasingly hardcore pornography and assume it, it can and should be recre recreated in their own life. The danger of this for sex education is that consent is undermined, as people can show scenes where the actors have off-screen agreed to perform these acts, but this expression of consent is never shown in the films itself in order to present the illusion of the scene being real. This can be an especially damaging message that porn can give to young people, whose first impression of sex often comes from porn. There are no real restrictions on what can be viewed, and likely no one telling you what you can and can't view. So how are you meant to know what, what is real, what isn't, what you can do, what you shouldn't? From the supposed safety of their bedroom, children and teenagers are exposed to literally anything. There's actually a kind of urban myth on the internet called the, on Rule 34, which states that you will literally be able to find a version of porn for anything you type in. I can recommend trying it, it's quite weird. <laughs> While it's not an official fact, a Harvard neuroscientist conducted an analysis of, the, of more than 55 million pornography searches in 2009 and 10 to help support this claim. Whilst, whilst this is not meant to be an attack on those who view porn, it is an attack on, on any suggestion that porn can be anything other than entertainment, and most definitely against it being used as a tool of sex education. It is no wonder that the UK is about to bring in a ban on porn pornographic content, which will introduce an age verification system on porn sites in order to prevent underage viewing in order to mitigate this issue. The obvious ca counterpoint to this argument is to say that porn should still have a place in sex education as it allows for exploration. However, my point here is not that young people should not be allowed to explore their sexuality, it is that before they even begin to do this, they should, before they even begin to do this, they, sh they are bombarded by the ease at which explicit and extreme content is available on the, in on the internet. There is evidence of this. Middlesex University conducted a study that concluded 44% of males aged between 11 and 16 who watched porn reported that it shaped their views of what they wanted to do during sex. If you compare this, and com if you compare this with the UK's family, the UK Family Planning Association's statement that the average median age of a heterosexual sexual encounter is 16 in the UK, you're saying that nearly 50% of people's first sexual encounter will be shaped by porn, which can be a, have very damaging consequences and potentially ruin a very delicate moment in a person's sexual development. This is because porn does not disclaim how it is out of touch with reality. This is not a failure of porn, but of sex education which I believe in its current form fails to properly teach young people about how to healthily explore their sexuality, meaning young people are left woefully misinformed in many of the most pressing areas that sex education should address, both to do with safety and sexuality. Instead of being able to openly talk and discuss sexual preferences, they learn from graphic porn, which can lead to their sexual appetite becoming jaded, so only hardcore pornography is sufficient for inciting pleasure. Also, thanks to its high levels of accessibility and instant gratification, if, por if porn is relied on for sexual education, it, have, it can have severe consequences both in future sexual acts, but also in people's ability to sustain, sustain their relationships, as it can undermine the level of sexual responsibility consumers feel. This cannot be seen as a healthy way for s someone to explore their sexual experience, as in fact inhibiting the freedom of young people to develop sexually in a healthy manner. Restricting porn from sex education is not inhi inhibiting these people's freedoms, but in fact giving them the freedom to explore their sexual preferences naturally, rather than being hooked on intense and unrealistic content. My underlying message is that whilst pleasure is an important part of sex, it needs to be safely explored, highlighting the significance of the act, the trust and consent behind the action, and its potential repercussions, which porn fails to do so. Porn, by presenting sex as sol solely as an entertainment, advertises an irresponsible approach of sexual health, not, not just in the mental ways I've discussed, but also physically. <laughs> For example, contra contraception, one of the most important aspects of sexual education, which helps prevent STIs and pregnancy, is rarely concerned or even shown in porn, as it is not beneficial to the fantastical element. This undermines the message of its importance, and I do not think it's a coincidence that young people aged less than 25 years in the UK experience the highest rates of STIs in the UK. I think that this is more, and more than anything shows how porn is unfit to be used in sex, sex education. I do hope in the future Porn will change to be more realistic, but I'm also conscious that porn, as I've said, is meant for entertainment. Therefore, it should not be relied on to safely educate people on sex. This idea of censoring porn because it's entertainment would be ridiculous. It'd be like asking all films set in space to be completely accurate, which would be, you know, absurd. The difference between the two genres is that a person doesn't watch Star Wars and believe it's real, or if they are, they're quickly, it's quickly pointed out by their peers. But with porn, because sex is such a taboo subject, 
people can learn something from it. Can, people can learn something from it. It's not discussed, and the only people harmed are yourself and anyone you happen to, to um, have as a sexual partner. I hope that I've helped convince that by voting no against this House's motion, you're denying the place of porn. You're not denying the place of porn in society, but that you're supporting a drive to help ensure that people are properly educated on matters of sex, which will benefit everyone. I have no problem with some of you viewing porn after this debate. It sounds like Spencer definitely will. But I hope that I've persuaded you to, uh, persuaded you to realize that you definitely should not be looking at it to learn anything about sex. Thank you.